Hi there, my name is Bo Manomo, also known as Thinker of Thoughts, the author of the blog at thoughtsandthingsandstuff.com. This is going to be an introduction to a new series of video podcasts to be hosted at thoughtsandthingsandstuff.com where we take time and interview some of the personalities that have popped up around the community of former Mormons on the internet. The first series of interviews is going to be a discussion with the Fridge Prophet, the author of churchofthefridge.com, winner of the 2013 Brody Award for Best New Blog of the Year. So without further ado, let's begin. <laughs> all right, so um, I want to welcome all of our viewers uh, out to the very first video podcast from Thoughts and Things and Stuff, where we take time and interview some of the interesting personalities from around the former Mormon community on the internet. For our very first podcast, we have the pleasure of uh, introducing Fridge Prophet from the blog. Uh, Church of the Fridge. Um, you want to go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself there, uh, Prophet? Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> His, he can be uh, seen. I guess he's got a, a sermon every Sunday or every week at churchofthefridge.com, and um, I know I have enjoyed many of his posts there, and uh, he was recognized as, uh, what, the best new blog of last year, and he got a Brody Award for 2013. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, the purpose of these interviews is really just to get a little bit of background and figure out, um, you know, what it was that uh, brought you to the point where you decided to get online and talk about some of the things that, uh, you know, affected you. So um, why don't we start out by... Uh, Give me a little bit of background about, uh, you know, how you came to be where you are now. What, where did you grow up? How did you, um, how did you form your years early on? <laughs> well, it's been a, as you can see, I'm an old man. At least I think I'm old. Got no hair. Got a beard. I don't know. So, I guess. Boy, you want like a whole life background or two minutes? You can you can summarize it. It doesn't have to be a novel. <laughs> well, I was born and raised on a farm in uh, in northern Utah. So I live right right in the middle of the Morador. I uh, come from a fifth generation Mormon family. My great 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 grandpa was a convert to the church back in Salem, Massachusetts. And everybody in my family is a member. And well. I guess like a lot of people that we get to know these days, I suffered a, a little bit of a crisis of faith. And that led from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another, <laughs> and pretty much ended up with me being a prophet. Well, oh. before we get there, uh, tell me a little bit about you growing up. Um, were you, you know, did you have the full Mormon experience in terms of oh, being yeah. involved in young men's and scouts oh, yeah. and mission and stuff like that? Yeah, born in the covenant. Uh, had uh, pretty much did everything any average Mormon family would have done. Uh, you know, I'm been, you know, did all the priesthood stuff, normal kid, scouting, pretty much everything. Uh, where did you serve your mission? Uh, Guatemala. And uh, uh, how did you find that experience? I uh, loved it, actually. It was a great experience for me. Uh, I spent probably, oh, about 18 months with no electricity or running water or anything like that. And honestly, it really was a good experience for me. I learned a lot about living life with no realizing that what you have in life really doesn't matter in terms of things. It's your attitude that makes the difference. I met people there that had absolutely nothing but were the happiest people on the planet. So it was a good experience for me. I see. And uh, 
the the sort of people that you met on your mission, um, what did you find that the message that you brought them, you know, how did it change their lives? How did, how did you see your work actually affecting the people there? Wow, you know, it was a... It, I was part of a very, very successful mission in uh, around 1989. Um, don't know if you know, but there were some huge high baptism missions in that time period. That was when the church was hitting the full stride of like 5% growth rates and all the projection of millions and millions of members. And here's a little tidbit that if you're a good researcher, you might figure figure out just exactly who I am. Um, my companionship was the highest baptism companionship of the highest baptism mission in the entire world at one month. <laughs> wow. We had 19 baptisms that month, and uh, it was literally the toughest companion I ever had. I wanted to kill him. <laughs> was, was, uh, was, was it because of his, um, you know, stick with it attitude that all those baptisms happened, or what happened? Nope, it was completely opposite of that. He was the most racist person I ever knew, and uh, he was he was, yeah, I I didn't like the guy at all. Nice. So he, you got back from your mission, and uh, where did your life move to after that? Well, um, I got back home. My girlfriend, she didn't. Wait, well, she waited for me, but, you know, not really. And so after that, we, after getting home, I dated for a couple of years and met my wife, who I had gone to high school with as well. And the after about a year of dating, we ended up getting again. married. What's that? Uh, you, your mouth wasn't moving for a second there, so... Uh, I was hearing cramp. the voices in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I hear lots of voices in my head. <laughs> so you, uh, the girlfriend that you was waiting for you on your mission didn't actually wait for you, and uh, you came home and found something better. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, in hindsight, I look at that now, and I think there isn't a... If I had married the other girl that, you know, we'd kind of had all that planned out and stuff, there is no way she would have handled the Christ the faith crisis that we went through, and I honestly think I, uh, she it would have probably ended a divorce. Oh yeah. So I'm 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 very happy that I married a much more outspoken, um, not your typical Mormon mom type, I guess. I see. So tell me a little bit about uh, how you got from there to where you are now. Oh, okay. Well, so, you know, we were the average Mormon family, typical average. Uh, I mean, we got five kids. We kind of lived up, moved up into the country in Cache Valley. And, uh, you know, I did, I, I served many different callings in the church, been uh, secretary in a bishopric, you know, the, the word secretary, uh, financial clerk, uh, uh, probably Probably elder, elders quorum president and Sunday school president were probably two of my most favorite callings. Uh, did elders quorum president when we moved to our new ward up here and did that for about seven years. Uh, and then wow. I started teaching Sunday school and between being a Sunday school teacher and after that calling, which I enjoyed a lot, I really liked teaching the kids. Uh, my favorite group were the kind of teenage years where kids are just starting to think for themselves and I really enjoyed helping them discover you know how great the world is and and how good it was to to learn and investigate and I think I just have a lot of natural teaching ability my uncle was a teacher my dad's been a teacher there's quite a few teachers back in our family history I actually ended up being an engineer all said and done but uh, over that time period which is about so I got back from a mission another 20 years or so. I, I did just about any calling. I did any calling I was ever asked to do, and then some. So in the sun, I was in the Sunday school for over a decade as either a teacher or the Sunday school president. And as Sunday school president, I don't know if you've, your awards are like mine, but uh, sometimes teachers just don't show up, and you have to be able to 
throw down a lesson at the drop of a hat and stuff like that. So I was pretty good at putting stuff together. Our Sunday school teachers mainly just had to ring the bell on time and make sure it that does have teachers. its benefits. <laughs> I did have a friend say that's the easiest job as long as you got teachers showing up. Exactly. Right. As long as you got teachers showing up, it's a great job. But there are the times they don't show. Yeah. So you uh, lived the Mormon dream for about 20 years, so you're probably uh, around 40 years old. Um, yeah, I was actually about 40. I, well, I probably should roll back the clock a little bit. Um, starting on my mission, and I, and I had read the Book of Mormon before on a mission. I decided I needed to do that, gain a testimony, do all that kind of stuff. And I had. Um, in fact, early on in my life, I had several deep, moving spiritual experiences. Um, there were times when I felt like angels had literally saved my life. Um, and other times when I was sure God was right there with me, right by my side, making sure that I was being taken care of. In fact, thinking about it now actually brings back some of those same emotions, talking about it. I, I had, you know, I, I don't think it was any way... Uh, non-spiritual, I guess, is what I'm saying. I've always been a very spiritual person that that, that, that understands that. Um, that would tend to fly in the face of the accusation that some ex-Mormons get where people say, well, you probably never really had a testimony or you never really worked oh, yeah. the the divine. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a nice little experience where a, uh, uh, an apologist kind of laid into me saying that that was impossible, that I may have never, there was no way possible I'd ever felt how he felt because I would not, I would, I would absolutely agree with him if I had. And yes. I'm sorry to say, but I am, I'm, I'm very confident I have felt exactly what he's talking about. Um, you know, spiritual experiences that move you to tears, uh, things like that. Yeah. That's a common theme that I get when I talk with my brothers, which is, you know, they say that they don't know how the spiritual experience of all these other religions and all these other faiths, you know, they're not really feeling the real spirit when their feelings tell them that their faith tradition is true. It's only their particular experience that they know about or can talk about. So that's yeah, a, that that was a bit of discovery on my part, I guess. So you're you're actually talking about a really interesting point. Um, uh, and I was, well, part of my, I got, you know, off sidetracked in my little history lesson yeah. there, but part of the well, we reason can, I... We can go back to some of those points <laughs> about the thing after we get to where you get to where you are now. Why don't we uh, hold off on that well, and you can tell us... Okay, so, well, so a few, a while back, I started studying, and it started on my mission. I actually got lectures of faith and oh, yeah. uh, Jesus the Christ, and uh, I actually had this this book called the... My brother and I called it the Three Ring Binder, and in that book were all sorts of, you know, faith promoting older, uh, you know, things that Q, Q. B. Brown, Hugh Nibley, stuff like that. And some of the things that I read, I really liked a lot. I don't know if you, if you actually go back and look at some of the things the apostles and prophets were saying around the turn of the century, yeah. it was very motivating in terms of. Go find the truth. It will always stand to the light of day. Uh, there is nothing to fear uh, when it comes to researching or understanding. And I did that. I did that a lot because I believed there was nothing to fear. And for me, uh, researching is part of who I am, actually. My job has ended up in I, I work in, in a facility and I run research and development as my day job. And, and I huh. love the research. So, so researching is something that kind of is a natural thing that I do. And so uh, back then I was researching a lot. Now, I never really researched anything that was, you know, that scary anti-Mormon stuff. You know, because yes. you weren't supposed to, you know, that was the surest way to die or go to hell or whatever else. It was terribly awful wrong. Worse than, worse than pornography. Oh, yeah. And I never really researched any of that. Um. But I had, you know, it was on the periphery of things I read. I, can't, I mean, obviously, I knew about polygamy. Um, I understood a few bits of tidbits here and there of things. 
Yeah. But but really didn't. I really didn't know them all. Um, but I did understand uh, lots of little things, and and the things that I had heard, I was sure where they were just lies. So, uh, it, you know, I I, I, I knew a lot of things, and there were a few things that didn't make sense when I logically thought about it, but they were pretty easy to put on a shelf and and set aside and just believe and and move forward in faith. And this is all while you were on your mission, twenty year old. Well, yeah, I, I, it's not only my mission, and and on my mission, I had tremendous spiritual experiences there as well in terms of healing the sick and counseling bereaved parents and, I mean, even being part of an earthquake. <laughs> it's amazing how many people will convert right after an earthquake, by the way. <laughs> but there was several... Uh, I had a very spiritual mission. In fact, one of my mission, uh, old mission companions is quite distraught with where I am today, and he re regularly berates me for my, you know, my choices to throw away that which I knew so well. Um, anyway, so that happened on my mission uh, over the next several, couple of decades. Uh, it, I didn't study near as deeply once I got home just because, you know, real life. I had college and I started raising a family and, you know, got really busy with college and school. And so some of those studies sort of slid aside for close to seven or eight more years. Once I finally started getting to the point I didn't have to go to school full-time and work full-time, I started studying again. And, of course, once I became Sunday school president and Sunday school teacher, which Sunday school teacher was one of those things I enjoyed a lot. So I'd go dig up, you know, some of those awesome old quotes I'd heard before, and I'd, I'd learn history, and I'd put it all together for the, for the class and, and, and show them things, you know, get, give them some of the ideas of what had gone on in the past and how to – how, you know, sometimes people aren't perfect, but that doesn't mean we, what we have isn't true. And uh, I've had, I, I was, I, I've been regularly in sacrament meeting giving talks or lessons. I've numerous, countless times, I've had people come up after and talk about how moving my lesson was or how spiritual of an experience. So I guess my point is a little along those lines that, uh, and I have met, and I'm not to say that I'm special anyway, because I have met others in the ex-Mormon community that never really felt the spirit, but I, I know I did. I'm 100% uh, I'm sure that the spiritual experiences I had were just like the ones that my parents, my relatives, my friends, uh, others rely on to uh, continue to believe the gospel and believe in the church. So everyone that I've talked to seems to have something that happens that brings them to the point where they're willing to look at things and allow for all possibilities. You know, suddenly you can actually ask the question, is the church true, and consider the range of possibilities, and that kind of starts their journey um, that, you know, eventually may lead to them disaffecting from the church. What started that for you? Well, I kind of look back, and there were there were always these little things that I kept putting on my shelf. The more I studied, the more I dug into it, and I remember reading Rough Stone Rolling, and and it was partly because I wanted to get to know Joseph Smith better. You know, I, I actually always believed uh, he was somewhat of a genius and was very smart. Uh, I, I never really quite bought that he was, you know, dumb as a rock story. I, yeah. I, I just didn't think you could do anything like this and be an idiot, you know. Um, so I tried to study more of that history. Uh, so things just kind of ended up on my shelf here and there, and I guess uh, I could feel that, and I call it the shelf because, I seriously, everybody knows what the Mormon shelf is, deny it or not. There's yep. on, on my son, his mission president called it the file box. Okay, so what? It's a file box, it's a shelf, whatever yeah. the metaphor is, it's a place you put the things up in your head, back here somewhere, kind of where you don't pay any attention. You put the things up there and you just don't think about them because they're not logical and they don't make sense. And it's not that you don't know what they mean. You say, well, I don't know why it's like that. So sure, you say, well, I don't know. But the reason you don't know they're like that is because they don't make sense if 
they're legit, then it brings into question, you know, your testimony and all these other things. So my shelf back up in that noodle, it it was steadily growing heavier over uh, easily over both two, both decades. You know, sometimes more, yeah. sometimes less. But I think what brought things to a head, and that's where you're going, is 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 some point in time something brings things to a head, and I had really been struggling, and I'd really been struggling for some time trying to make those things fit. And one, one night I started uh, studying the Book of Abraham. And I got to tell you, Book of Abraham and the theology in it, I, I love the theology. In fact, I still do to a certain extent. Uh, the concept of eternal progression, all of us are capable of far more. We're we're divine beings, uh, you know. We're gods in embryo, uh, mm-hmm. as man, as God once was, as man now is. God once was, you know that whole deal. The I first love. estates and oh yeah, the, first estates, second estates. My dad and I used to talk about those things all the time. You got to keep your first estate, you keep your second estate. The idea of this eternal projection, line upon line. You know, I'm a natural learner. I like to learn stuff. I like to learn, I like to teach, so knowledge is a big deal to me. And so all that progression in knowledge, the line up on line and precept stuff, I loved it. And of course, a lot of that comes out of the book of Abraham. Yep. And uh, so I started studying the book of Abraham and and you know, about this time, this when I you know, back in this is kind of the early two thousands, uh, internet is, you know, well embedded in everybody's lifestyle, and I started Using Google to look stuff up. Whoa, it's me. Who knew what that was going to lead to, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started looking up the Book of Abraham, and you know, you really, 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 really got to just turn off your brain if you want to believe the Book of Abraham is legit. And I mean, you're basing this on what? Because you already talked about the doctrine of the book of Abraham being okay. What is it that you have to turn off your brain for to take and accept as legitimate? Uh, how it came to pass. Where it came from. Okay, so you're talking about the papyrus. Yep. You see, I I had no idea we'd found the papyrus until like around 2000. Mm-hmm. I, I had zero clue. Until I one day Googled it, ran into it, and I was like, whoa, check that out. You know, it was, it, if you look at the pictures on the papyrus and you look where the tears are and the, the scratches are, you can actually, I mean, you can see the freaking pencil marks where they sketched in, you know, the uh, Pharaoh's head and where they sketched in the hands, you can see the pencil marks on the piece of paper. I mean, any child that's drawn crayon drawings can see it. Yeah, but, but they could just say, well, you know, Joseph revealed it and he restored it, and he had to do that with pencil markings. So the fact that there are pencil markings there. Sure, sure, sure but, but the, here's my point, is this is where you if, you, if you start actually, you know, connecting the dots and look at the pencil markings, you, you look at it and... You go to every other Egyptologist on the whole planet that's not Mormon, and they all say, hey, this translation over here is total bullshit. That's <laughs> literally what they say. I mean, I'm, I'm being a little profane, sure, but that's to give you a little shock value. They are saying it's made up, completely made up. I'm not talking like a little bit close or sort of off. It's like... It's like... T- taking the translation and say, mi nombre es Juan, and that means my name is John, and saying, nope, mi nombre es Juan, I ate a bear. It, it's not even close. Of course, I didn't actually believe all those scholars because I figured they're full of crap. Yeah, they so, don't know what they're talking about. They, so, I bought, <laughs> so I bought myself a book on Egyptology and learned how to read Egyptian. Oh, really? You went that far into it? <laughs> I really, really wanted to keep my shelf up. But I, I, I got to the point that I could read enough Egyptology, I could look at the cartouches, I could compare, you know, back and forth. And I got to tell you, Stargate, 
is more accurate than the Book of Abraham. So, oh, you know, boy. if you want to learn Egyptian, go watch Stargate because they got it a lot closer than the Book of Abraham. You have to you have to imagine that one telling thing is that you know if when they discovered the papyri, it actually did match up. You can bet that every single one of our editions of the scriptures would have reproductions of all the papyri with correlation between the text and the oh, hieroglyphics. Yeah. Just well, like, you it, know, Greek Bibles do and things like that. Yeah, they'd be sticking the maps in there. You know, there's like maps of Jerusalem jammed all over in the Bible because they know where it is. Yeah. Where's that in the Book of, book of Abraham? Where's that in the Book of Mormon? I mean, come on, guys. Think. Okay, so you're... You're Think. reading the book of Abraham. You've you've discovered this stuff. What what is what what? How does that change the rest of your existence as a church member? Okay, well, I um, so I discovered the book of Abraham problem. Um, I I literally, after a lot of study, I finally think. I, I and I I didn't let it. I mean, I did not just give up on the book that easy. I hope that's coming through clear. We're talking about a period of a year or two of me studying and learning Egyptian and trying to come to some type of conclusion that that book wasn't made up. And I couldn't get there because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's dozens of times Joseph Smith says, I was translating. He spent thousands of dollars for these scrolls. Um, the church itself, if you dig back in the history, when they found the scrolls over in the Chicago Museum and they got them back, they dumped hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars into getting them translated. And then they buried all that. All that got shelved, hidden, stuffed away because guess what? It didn't match. So, the book Abraham, I, I finally came to the conclusion that uh, Joseph Smith was making it up. He was flying by the seat of his pants. And it was some great doctrine. I love the doctrine. Don't get me wrong. I still do. But it, well, what it about the translation? There's what no about the explanation that he received. You know, the word translation means something different. You know, they say the city of Enoch was translated, and yeah, yeah, you, you, you could say that it's just it was you know the catalyst for inspiration. actually, actually, my ex comp, my old mission comp, I was telling you about earlier. We had a huge discussion on this, and and I get where I get where they're coming from. I really do. But come on, if some guy was trying to sell you on Amway and he strung together a line of a line of contingencies like, well, so maybe the word translate doesn't mean translate, but it's still real fun to read, right? So here, buy some Amway. You'd be you'd be telling that guy to go fly a freaking kite. I mean, you got to at least be reason reasonably willing to think critically. And and I realize that some people aren't, and and the reason they aren't is a whole deep level of psychology that uh, that I studied later on. I because I, I experienced it myself. I, you know, I I didn't want it to be false, not even close. I loved the doctrine. I wanted it to be this legit translation. Um, but you're really grasping at straws. I mean, you just you just are. Okay, um, so did you? share your findings with your wife at this point or did she know you were looking and digging into this? Nope. I was scared. What um, did you think was going to happen? Well, for one, I, I, I still actually believed in the church at this point. So I uh, hadn't lost my testimony yet. If That's kind of interesting. Um, fast so, forward a little bit. So I still believed in the church, but I stuck the whole book of Abraham, the whole idea. I mean, I was... I was reasonably sure it was made up. There, there was, there really wasn't any significant proof to the otherwise. Uh, you know, translate versus translate. You can go read it up. You can, you can look at the pictures on the Joseph Smith Papers website and compare the art, the very letters they were translating to stuff that doesn't translate to. And yeah. you, you, you just, if you actually do any legitimate research, it, it comes out made up. But I still believed. That's I not too hard to do topic. because it, it almost seems like they've almost just kind of created a blank spot in lessons and talks. They just don't really reference the, the Book of Abraham much anymore. Oh, yeah. At least that's what I noticed. 
and I kind of think that's part of the reason the the doctrine of eternal progression seems to be slipping away into the darkness as well. Because that's where yeah. it came from. Well, yeah, that that was the foundation. That it was the Book of Abraham, and then the King Follett sermon that really set the stage for that. Yeah. And, and without that, you know, it's the whole intelligence has always existed. God always existed, and so did we. God didn't create us. He just gave us some bodies to hang out in. You know, it's like we're all, you know, Joes in the universe hanging out together. And that's where you really diverge from conventional Christian theology. Oh, yeah. And in a lot of ways, it actually makes a lot more sense because God with a little g that isn't really truly all-powerful makes a lot more sense than the all-powerful, omniscient, all-loving, everywhere-but-nowhere God of Christianity. I mean, I any... Anybody that's done some deep theology, theological studies in Mormonism is really actually quite adept at disproving all the other ideals of God. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why you have so many people that go straight from Mormonism to right on to or frigidarianism. Oh, this we won't we won't exclude that. <laughs> okay, so how did you uh, get to the point where you were going to share your findings with your wife, or or what was the next big phase after the book? Oh, of that's a good question. I. Uh, and this is on my blog, if you ever go over there and you want to read this in, you know, my hairy old words. Uh, it's called The Collapse of My Shelf. Yeah. The, I, I kind of, I still didn't actually really tell my wife yet with the Book of Abraham thing. And I put that whole episode, I put it all on my shelf and for a little while, um, I just believed. I, I had studied. I studied some uh, of what Brigham Young did and some early church history, kind of in this time frame. I bounced around and I, you know, I I'd read Rough Stone Rolling. I learned about Kirkland, the Kirkland Bank history. I found out why Joseph Smith was really killed, and it had nothing to do with persecution and everything to do with the fact he, you know, destroyed a newspaper that was telling the truth about him. Um, and things just kind of just, I kept stacking these things on my shelf. Oh, holy cow, look at that. Uh, put it on the shelf. Uh, then I think, oh, put it on the shelf. Yeah. And so my shelf is getting really heavy. Um, I went through kind of a revision of faith because I, I really struggled with some of the crap Brigham Young did. And uh, one time I was, I was praying really, really hard to try to figure out why all this stuff was what it was. You know, I was like, God, why in the world would you let that guy, you know, and I, I, I actually believe that, you know, some people will claim why or what not, but when I look at the history, I think Brigham Young had something to do with the Mountain Metals Massacre, and he certainly had a ton to do with blood atonement, and he certainly wasn't nice to his wives, and the guy was a shrewd businessman that took advantage of anybody around him. And so I, I, I wondered about bringing me on. I was like, God, why would you let that guy buy him, you know? I yeah. mean, this guy was not a good man. Uh, no matter how much we've held him up, if you study the record, he was not a very nice guy. And I remember praying really hard one night, trying to put together how can all this stuff contradict what I know? How could these guys be who they are, you know? How could all this be true? And I got a very probably one of the most spiritual experiences of my life where I heard a voice inside my head. Um, it kind of went like this. So, God, what's the deal with this? Well, son, you know, sometimes these guys just aren't perfect. Yeah, but, you know, what's the deal? Why, why do that? Well, son, yeah, Brigham Young was a real jerk, but, you know, I needed him to get... Like people across the plains, I needed a real dink to, you know, a real dickhead to get those people to move, and that's what I needed. And yeah, that meant he got stuck in the prophecy, prophet thing, and all that crap he taught was, you know, just bogus. But you know, you what you gonna do? You got to do what you got to do. And and I and I asked other things. I said, hey, well, God, well, what about this whole gay marriage thing? Well, son, people just really aren't ready for that. It's gonna be okay, just like polygamy was okay. But right now, people can't handle it, so, you know, we just got to, you got to do what you got to do. And, and I literally, for about an hour and a half, I had a conversation with a voice in my head. It was extremely moving, extremely spiritual, and I thought I might be going crazy. 
when I got done with that, I shelved everything for months. I just I set it all aside, and I said that was an incredibly moving spiritual experience. I even told a couple people about it, but I never told anybody all the details because I felt like, you know, it was too spiritual to tell everybody all the details. Um, so I set that all aside for a while and just believed. I eventually couldn't leave it alone, though. I eventually had to come back and look at the history some more, think some more, and I grabbed my Book of Mormon. I've, I've read the Book of Mormon probably 12 or 15 times. It never ceases to amaze me how often I get in a theological debate with somebody who can tell me they know the church is true, and they haven't even freaking read the book. They've read, like, you know, First Nephi 15 times, yes. or three or four passages that were really awesome. They never read the whole thing, but, oh, by God, they know the church is true, but never read it all. Those guys drive me nuts, by the way. I read it at least a dozen times. One time on my mission, I read the entire book in one day straight. It was a speed reading contest to get like an overview. But I turned to the Book of Mormon one last time because honestly, my shelf was ready to collapse. It hadn't yet, but it was ready to go down. Well, Eller Holden, Holland was right. You're, you, were, you were at the point where you were going to have to crawl around over, in, through, or under the Book of Mormon. Oh, yeah, baby. And I remember that talk. That talk was not, that talk was right in the middle of my, my I guess, what would you call it, fridge theophany. <laughs> So I, 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 I read that book one last time. And what was really interesting is I think I read it with a different perspective because this time through, the illogic of it, the anachronisms, all the issues with it, they looked like glaring red stoplights going fraud, 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 fraud. They were all there. And I just, it was almost as if I had never, ever seen them before. And I was like, have I really read this book before? Are you serious? That says that in there? You know? The contradictions and the and the stuff. And when you when you don't read the story of Nephi with the eye of this is God's true will, what you've got is a teenager murdering a drunk dude. I mean, come on. Oh yes. If you had a teenager murdering a drunk dude on TV today you would be freaking out about how wrong it is. Come on, people, think. Oh, and That's the people who I make excuses say. for that just drive me insane. And, but, but you realize the reason you do that, it's all psychology. But we'll get there later because the psychology of it all is something that I also learned along the way. But my point is, I read the Book of Mormon one last time, crawled under it, threw it, around it, over it, and I finally realized... You know, whatever the theory, whether it's Spalding theory or late war theory or, you know, whatever the theory, it's completely possible Joe Smith made it up. And there was a particular thing I was studying when I was reading the Book of Mormon. I was, I had heard a friend at work, he said, uh, and, and for me this was a kind of a big deal because I served my mission in Guatemala. And when I went to Guatemala, that was the place the Book of Mormon lands. I mean, it was, everybody's like, Oh, yeah, right there, down there, that, that's the narrow lake of land. In fact, our mission yep. president told us the valley we were in was named after narrow neck of land. So, you know, we kind of thought, oh, well, the polo cheek means narrow neck. So must be the Book of Mormon. But I yep. kind of had a problem with that definition because if the valley I was in was the narrow neck of land, I couldn't walk from sea to sea in a day and a half. <laughs> it, no freaking way, dude. I... I've walked a day and a half, and I didn't even cover one one thousandth of that length of the you know Guatemala City. It's like, hey, go walk across Utah and California in an hour and a half. See how well you do, or a day and a half. It ain't gonna happen. It doesn't make sense. And that was on my shelf at the time I was reading the Book of Mormon last time. And I thought, I had a friend at work said, you know, I think the small geography model that it all took place in Upper State New York. I think that he told me is legit. And I'm like, what? I'd never heard of this model before. What's a small geography model? I'd only ever heard of the, you know, the it happened in Central America model. So yeah. I started Googling some more. Damn, Google teaches you all sorts of bad stuff. So I Googled some more, and I found uh, the small geography model. And uh, if you look it up, I can't remember. 
uh, Vern Holly, that's who it was. I stumbled on some maps that were called, they're called the Vern Holly maps. And this guy named Vern Holly had put them together. And I stumbled onto them and I saw this map of, you know, upstate New York and Pennsylvania area. And they had the Book of Mormon names scattered all around. And, and the narrow neck of land was the strip between the two Great Lakes up above where Joe Smith lived, you know. And there's a valley and a mountain range. And, dude, it matches good. I can see, I, I saw immediately why these guys were proponents of the small geography model. That all this took place in the, you know, that one little state area. It made a ton of sense. Because it fits. The geography fits upstate New York to a T. And so at first I was actually pretty excited because I thought, hey, finally it fits. That means we can figure this stuff out. All we got to do is, you know, dig here, dig there. And, and, but, you know, back of my mind is, why isn't the church doing that? Yeah. You know, and, I, and of course that question, well, you know, they didn't exactly talk about the Book of Abraham stuff, papyri either. So that's kind of sneaking around in the back of your head. On this same website where I read about this small geography model, I saw another map. And the map was of 1820 Erie, New York State, and Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And on that map was a list of about 20 or 30 names. One that's extremely obvious is the name Lehi. L-E-H-I-G-H. You drop off the G-H, you don't even freaking change the pronunciation. It still says Lehi. There's an entire valley named Lehi in upstate New York in 1820. But Oops. believe it or not, that and there's Tiancum and Tecumseh, there's there's o Oneida, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's at least a dozen names that are really obvious things in the Book of Mormon. And for me, as you can tell, I'm actually an author. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually wrote a book too besides my whole blog thing. That's, that's just a side fun deal. But I'd written a book and I'd even written some fiction. And one thing I learned when writing fiction and publishing it was you write what you know. If yeah. you want your story to have emotion and, and feel right, you steal from the world around you when you make your fiction. You, you, you steal pieces and parts. And so it was really obvious to me, dude, he could have easily just stole these names. And that was the first time my testimony actually rocked at its foundations. I, for the first time, I realized maybe... Maybe it's all BS. Maybe so it's you all made still, up. You were still holding out for Joseph Smith at the beginning and the Book of Mormon. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I was, and I still haven't, I still didn't stop. I can't believe, uh, the, the psychology that I was in at the time blows my mind because I still believed. I said, I, I'm telling you, it was just the first time I thought, maybe the first time I legitimately questioned it. Because I, I realize that we humans, we say we question stuff, we say we check it out. Yeah, that's a load of crock. Because when I legitimately questioned it, it was as if my world was going to collapse. Yeah. I, I mean, thinking about it, I was seriously scared. And I didn't want it to collapse. And I actually thought, well, maybe these names, the reason they match... Maybe they're old, you know, Book of Abraham names, or, or I'm sorry, they're old Book of Mormon names, and they just ended up on the map because, you yes. know, after 2,000 years, these names stuck around, right? The Lamanites are still carrying them around. Exactly, and I thought, well, that could be, that could be it, that could be it, yeah, 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 that could be it. And so this, this, this whole collapse happened over about two nights. All the next night, I got on Google, I found old USGS maps, and I got to tell you, if you ever go search through old USGS maps, uh, they're a pain in the butt. They're, they're, you can't read anything on them. They're really hard to look for. But after two days of searching on these old 18, 19, 18, 20 Pennsylvania maps, I found the names in some of those areas. So the names were legit. The names were really there. They weren't some dude making it up and trying to make the names match the map. So I knew that. But I thought, well, maybe the towns didn't exist. What, what's with this? 
this uh, this Lake Alma. Where did that Lake Alma come from? Where did that uh, where did this uh, Valley Lehigh come from? Where did where did Oneida come from? And 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 all these towns. And so I would go to the towns websites and search back and find out. Oh yeah, you know, turns out that name was Jewish or that name. <laughs> That name these guys brought in, you know, there there wasn't a there there wasn't a single name that well I guess there was at least one the Tiant the Tecumseh name that had some Indian roots in it but that was the only one and that was back to the tribe of Tecumseh Indians which you know maybe we named a guy Tiankum after the Tecumseh Indians and and he just happened to match the exact same story that was written about in the Revolutionary War and the Kingsmen and. You know, I, I I think you need to understand that at this point in time, I had already read all the anti-Mormon stuff about the Book of Mormon. I had already studied all the the anachronisms. Where, you know, like where the where in the hell did the horses go, and where did two million swords disappear? I had all that in my head, and I still believed until yeah. I realized, legitimately, possibly, it was made up. And your and, wife is still in the dark at this point about the journey you've been on? Oh, yeah. She still doesn't know anything. Um, I, I decided that it was made up. And that was the night my, my shelf completely collapsed. It, and I, I, I've talked to many people, and I think you, you yourself have probably experienced it, the discovery of something you've invested your life in, the discovery that that's a fraud is a terrible, terrible feeling. Um, brought me to tears realizing it, but uh, it was it was a terrible time. What so, were the things that gave you the greatest pain about that realization? Uh, number one, if that if that isn't true if all this if all this stuff is just bs that some guy made up then all the promises that are based on that are just as bs the whole idea that we can be an eternal family forever the idea of eternal progression somebody just made that up too because it's founded on something somebody else made up you can't make up new stuff and then say you can't say Hey, God gave us the priesthood to do whatever we want. If that bit's a lie, if that bit's not real, nothing else is. As far as the the goals and the promises of the church, that sure you can have good feelings, you can have good will towards man, but every religion has that. Mormonism was very unique, and part of what drew me to it, part of what kept me believing and kept me loving it, was the eternal progression, the eternal family. I, I was never a Mormon because it was a nice club to hang out in. I'm actually a very asocial person. I was never there because, hey, I like the social aspect. I was there because I 100%, I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was true. And that collapsed that night. Yeah. I eventually told my wife, and it almost cost a divorce. We went through months of pain and turmoil. She couldn't understand why I would, you know, just give up on our family and all those things. But as I explained it to her, she understood, but she never she never really understood for quite a while. She she kind of, you know, went to church without me. I would go occasionally to support the kids. But I but I really didn't do anything. I wasn't very outspoken about it. I just was kind of what do you call it? I, I slipped into inactivity. And that, that, that's kind of was in and out of activity for like a year or so before. I eventually, oh, I got to tell you a quick, quick flip back in time. Uh, before I had my spiritual experience in hearing voices, I'd kind of gone through a little bit of similar struggle with the veracity of things. I didn't totally lose my faith, but I was struggling. And I, met, I had a, met with my bishop and talked about it. And, you know, he couldn't answer, even remotely answer any of the questions I had. But he told me he was sure that I was going through this trial because I was such a great teacher and I was so spiritual and someday I'd be bishop and I'd be able to answer everybody else's questions about the very problem I was having. That's why I was doing it, he told me. And then he warned me not to tell my boys about my struggles, that I should just leave them in the dark. At uh -huh. the time, 
I kind of bought that. I kind of bought that hook, line, and sinker bit. Uh, of course, you know, because it's like, well, yeah, God maybe does have something in store for me, and maybe he does want me to be a bishop someday or whatever this guy says. And and I realize now that my bishop, who at the time was a really nice guy, he still is. I, I think he's a great man and a, a wonderful, loving person that cares. And at the time, I think he fully believed what he told me. But that part about not telling your children, I think that's just kind of Mormon rote. If you, your testimony is struggling, it's like a no-no to tell anybody about it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You, you're just, you, you, the one thing you don't ever do in church is openly show doubt. You don't talk about it. Doubt is not good. That is to be kept buried. And, and so I did. I buried it. You know, and even after I stopped believing, I buried that. I thought, well, these boys, they're loving it. My, my oldest is getting ready to serve a mission. Um, my next oldest, you know, the, my boys are like 19 and 17 at the time. Wow. And uh, my, I actually sat down with them and told them, I don't believe in the church anymore, and I want you to know. I finally, I finally, said, I finally decided my bishop was wrong about me not talking to my children after I talked to my wife. And... We went through a really rough struggle, emotional struggle with our state president uh, and my son because my son was dating her daughter, his daughter, Oops. and we there was kind of a anyway we we had we had a whole separate item that had nothing to do with you know the church, but I had actually told my state president I was doubting Joseph Smith and and he started berating me because I wasn't paying tithing and I was going boating too much and and I was like dude. That's not the issue. You're not hearing me. <laughs> I don't believe he's a prophet. <laughs> and after I told my state president that, I realized that my boys deserved to know that this was a lot of crap that I could tell these guys but not tell my own children. So I told my own children that night, my two oldest boys, my youngest kids, I figured it was probably a little rough still. And I told them, you know, you guys can go to church. You, uh, this is not something that there's never going to be any forced belief in this house. People need to learn to think critically, make up their own decisions, and, and, and follow their hearts and their minds. So, I... Uh, Did you go through and show them the things that caused you to have um, a new perspective? Not outright, no. I told them if they wanted, you know, I could send them some links and a few things to look at. And, and my one son, my, my, one of my sons is very spiritual, the, the second oldest. He, he said, yeah, I'd like to look at that, and, and, and I sent him some stuff. My oldest son, I think he was a little more indoctrinated and felt like he needed to serve a mission because that's what you're supposed to do. That's, that's what he told me anyways, I said. And I told him, you know, I don't ever regret going on my mission. I don't. It was a really good experience for me and the people I lived amongst and what I learned about life and all sorts of lessons I still value today. And I think he thought that was, you know, well, maybe I can go on a mission, even if I'm not 100% sure it's true. I can go on a mission for that reason. Yeah. But the, I, I still was kind of just an inactive, you know, I was becoming your standard inactive dad. And I just, I'd lost my testimony. It was completely in chatters. My wife still believed. Um, my kids were not sure anymore. Um, but they went to church, my oldest especially. He was probably the most most dedicated, and, and like I said, he put in his mission papers, and and we we prepared we prepared to go through the temple, and and we prepared to you know him to go on a mission and everything, and 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 I I kind of got in a real rough spot there because my oldest was he was preparing to go through the temple, right, and. I guess, I don't know if, I'm not real proud of it, I guess, but I really tried to shelf my beliefs one last time, or shelf my doubts one last time. So you could be and, there with him in the temple? Exactly, because my dad was there with me, you know, and I was, I went through the temple pre-1990, and I was there for the, the you know, the, the, the penalties. The, you know, those penalties and things you did and all that, you know, belly stuff, and anyway, I, I was there for that, and when I went through the temple personally, it was a very traumatic experience. My first time stuck out in my head like crazy, and and I just I just said I don't want my son to have to go through that and me not be there. And so I thought I'll just I'll just believe I'll just 
I'll do what, I don't know, was Oaks or one of the prophets said. They said, hey, if you just profess your testimony, just tell it, just go bear it, you know. Yep. Even if you're not sure, just bear your testimony, say you know, and then you'll believe. And I thought, well, one last time, maybe I can do that. You know, I've paid my tithing for, you know, the, that year he was getting ready, and I, I got, you know, I became a full tithe payer, and, and the only issue I had was, well, do you believe in the restoration? And that's the, that was the question that I had to answer in the interview that was like, I had to think about that, you know? And deep down, I didn't really believe, but I said, yes, I believe. I was, I was telling myself at the time that I need to profess belief and then I will again. And then maybe it'll all be okay, you know? I'll, well, I'll, you were I'll just I'll doing what uh, the Apostle Oaks told you to do. Well, that, that's how I felt about it, but I think maybe I was playing my own psychological tricks on my mind now in hindsight. But I said, I'm just going to believe, and I'm going to be there for my son. Because family, you know, family is important to me. It's super important. That's part of the reason the church was important, because family was important, and family is important to the church. You know, it's, it's all a big, happy family. You seal people from one generation to another through eternity. Talk about family, it's a monstrous family. So, so how did that experience go? That that was really rough. My ex last experience in the temple was with my son, and and it was. Uh, It was something that struck me forever, and probably is. It, it set the stage for where I'm at today. I, I took him through, and I and I got to tell you, my my own time in the temple, I, I remembered when I walked through that veil the last time, and you know, after I'd done all the thing, I'd made all those commitments, and you had no idea, you know, I, I had done all that, and I walked through, into the slush room, and my dad said kind of makes you think you belong to a different religion, doesn't it? <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah. yeah. This is when you were when you yeah. were young going through the first time? I was 19 first time. Yeah. And, and I was like, uh, yeah, that was really freaking weird, you know. And the first time I went through, I remember thinking, still today, I remember thinking as I'm doing these oaths where I'm promising to die, I'm thinking, isn't this what secret combination do? Guys, haven't you read the Book of Mormon? This is a freaking secret combination. That's what it's in my head. So it's actually more like this. Hey, guys, come on. Think about it. Isn't this a freaking secret combination? Jeez. Is it? And I'm looking around the room at everybody, and it's like, you guys are all doing it. I'm just yelling this in my head. But I just shut up like everybody else, and I didn't say a thing. And, you know, I did all the stuff you're supposed to do and all that. So... I didn't realize it, but way back at the beginning of my, you know, becoming full-blooded endowed Mormon, I had gone through a very traumatic experience, and I had buried it. In fact, weird thing is I have a, one of my best friends today. We went through within a month of each other, and today he doesn't remember the blood oaths. He doesn't really? he ever existed. He has completely, 100% blocked them out. They're gone. Wow. In his mind, they don't exist in his memory, and and it's and in hindsight, I look back at that and I think, uh, isn't that like you know an abused child or that you know yeah. when you you actually block out bad experiences, uh, you know somebody gets hazed in a in a sorority and they forget about it ever happening, or you know a child suffers some type of abuse and he completely forgets about it. In fact, sometimes they they're such traumatic things that they you know, end up becoming schizophrenic personalities. Uh, you know, that's totally possible. I could be completely schizophrenic. I mean, I'm a freaking puppet right now. But <laughs> You're not alone, brother. <laughs> that's right. So anyway. In, in this temple experience, you said that it was completely unlike, um, you know, it, it was very different from your prior experiences. Was this all happening in your head, or was well, something yeah, happened? So, so after my first experience of the temple, I kind of buried that. I went on my mission, came back, the oaths were changed, and it wasn't near as, you know, freaky. 
they still had. I, I, I will tell you this. I never, ever, ever, ever did initiatories again. They, they went too far with me on that one. Even when they changed them, I couldn't ever do them again. Just, it just was wrong, dude. Uh, stranger touching you naked, uh, get over it. It's wrong. I, and I can't believe they took till 2005 to change that. But I, I still actually have no memory of that. I know it happened, but I don't remember. It happened, but you blocked it out. You blocked it out because it was there. So I, I blocked that out. You know, I blocked it out, and I, and I, I never, ever did initiatories again. I, that was once was it. I thought, I don't care. If all my relatives die, somebody else can go do that crap. <laughs> um, so I never did those again. And I never, and I don't think I realized. I, you know, I started. I went back to the temple because that's what you're supposed to do. I went on my mission. We went to the temple every single week in the MTC. And then on your mission, we never did temple work because you're working for the living, not the dead. I don't know if they told you that, but that was the deal on my mission. We didn't do any temple work. I got to go through the temple once on my mission, right near the end, um, and uh, and that was it. So I came home, and you know, I did the temple marriage. My wife and I are married in in the Logan Temple. And uh, and you know that that was that was after I got home, and we went back pretty regular. We were kind of monthly type temple goers, and 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 I tried to understand the doctrine and you know explore what was going on. I I had that whole entire thing memorized like the fifth time through. I could I and actually probably still say most of it for verbatim, you know. It's I completely memorized. So a little bit of me always wondered where's all this new light knowledge I'm supposed to get coming from, and then I would start to think about the movie and talk about the scenes and you know I actually believe we're really really good at making stuff up in our own brains especially have an active imagination and mine's really active so I kinda come out with oh this was a wonderful thing and you know I I, I, I literally was a full-on believer in the temple and the, you know the everything that was the good about it but this last time through here I'm with my son and in my head I'm thinking Man, I should have told him. You know, he's sitting there right next to me. He's here on my right side. No, on left side. I'm the expert. He's sitting right here on my left side. And I'm thinking, he doesn't know he's going to promise everything. He doesn't know he's going to promise to never talk evil about these people. He doesn't know he doesn't know anything is happening. And part of me wanted to say, when they say, when they say you can get up and leave. Go, man, go, go, just leave. I'll go with you, I promise. If you get up and leave, I'll go with you. That's what I'm saying in my head. I'm, I'm literally wishing he would back out. And, you know, we had a, we, we actually had a whole chance to sit and talk to the temple president before, you know, he did his endowment. And I was too chicken to ask the temple president all these questions that have been bugging me. You know, it was like... I, I was seriously sitting right there, you know, six inches away from the guy going, dude, what do you know about, why did you change the blood atonement? Why did, what do you know about the blood atonement? What do you know about this? What do you know about that? All the stuff that was on my shelf, I just shut up and didn't ask him because it was, you know, it was my son's day. I wasn't going to screw it up by being the apostate that got caught in the temple. <laughs> um, but the, but I didn't ask him. You know, I just kept trying to believe, and I, and I kept hoping for a really magical... I wanted a really spiritual moment, you know. I thought maybe when I walk through this veil with my son and I see my family there, you know, maybe maybe then I'll believe again and it'll all be okay and, you know, all this stuff, we can just forget about it and, you know, maybe then somehow I'll figure, I'll have a grand revelation that will make it all okay. And, you know, I helped him through that and I helped him into the veil and and we're standing in the slusher room and I'm looking at his face and I'm I'm seeing me from... 20 years ago. I'm looking at my son and I'm looking how shell-shocked he was and yeah. how he's look the, the look on his face because I know he was smart. He read the Book of Mormon too. He knew what a freaking secret combination was. He knew what all that stuff was. He was a smart kid and and I'll never forget these words ringing in my ears as we walked out of the, you know, we all hugged and everybody was happy. My dad was as happy as he's ever been. My mom was ecstatic and everybody was just so happy. But we all went to walk out those doors. And I told him, I said, you can ask me anything, son. And he always knew that. We've had extremely good conversation, uh, extremely good uh, communication with our children, my wife and I, throughout our years. 
And as we walked out those doors, he looked at me and he says, Dad, did I just join a cult? Yeah. And, man, that was like getting stabbed in the heart, man. All the, all the pain I felt, all the weirdness I felt from 20 plus years ago, you know, when, I, when my head was screaming, there's something wrong here and nobody notices it, can't you all see it? All those feelings I had, they came crashing back on me. And at that point in time, I, I thought, dude, you're complicit in it. Because you were unwilling to stand up for things you knew. You were unwilling to tell somebody the truth that, you know what? By any definition, yeah, it's a cult. By Is any that what you told definition. Him? No, I didn't. I just shut up and said, let's go buy lunch. <laughs> I was still a chicken. Were you but, thinking but, that your son was complicit in it or that you continued to be was, complicit in it? I was complicit in it. I had just drug my own child through the same mind games that I had been drugged through a generation before. And it almost seemed like he was even more bold in speaking his mind to you. Cause... Oh, yeah. He was, he was... I didn't have that, I don't ever think, with my parents. I think the if you go back, my parents are the you know baby boomer generation. You never really spoke back to your parents. Maybe others did, but I didn't. You know, I I was too chicken to talk to my dad and mom about really serious stuff, and I just kind of kept it all inside. But raising our children, my wife and I decided that that communication was super important, and and we've always had an ability to talk boldly to each other and sit down and tell us you know each other what's going on. Well, that's pretty bold. Yeah, it was really bold. That's what he said to me. And I was like, holy freaking cow. What, what have what, we done? What did you guys talk about over lunch? Oh, we just shelved it all over lunch because, you know, the whole family was there and everybody's having a good old time, you know. Uh, we, we shelved it and didn't even talk about it anymore. And But something had changed inside of me. I knew if I was... I, I couldn't do it again. I realized that I'd gotten my answer. It just wasn't what I wanted. I knew the church wasn't true. I was confident that was the case. And even though I knew that, I hadn't told my son what kind of thing he was getting himself into. I pretended not to tell him. I thought, why the hell was I like that? Why did I, you know, just hide from him? What's wrong with me? Am I a coward? Where's my integrity, Darren? What... What what is wrong with you? It's and kind of like when your bishop said, "Don't talk to your son." It's this entity that injects itself between you and your family. Yeah, exactly. You're you're stuck inside inside the Borg. The you're part of the Borg. That that is kind of a funny you know analogy, but it's very true. You're part of the collective, and you don't speak bad about the collective, and you're just not supposed to talk about it. You know, even, I mean, to the freaking point, you're not supposed to talk bad about the leaders. And what's that with that loud laughter thing? I mean, come on. <laughs> Where's, who's, who hasn't broken that covenant? Jeez. But it's just, it's, it, it strikes me now, in hindsight, that I was afraid. I was fearful to speak my mind. I was afraid to tell people what I knew. And it was all because of the fact they were in my head. And But between you and your son at that point, he already knew that you had had a crisis of faith, that you had seen problems. You, you know, already had kind of your answer at this point, and yet it still has its tentacles in, in your head? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I have spent the last two years trying to unweave those tentacles from my brain. It, it, we, I've discovered that us as humans, we are, we are Pavlovian creatures. We, we have serious issues when it comes to repetition. I mean, you know, if you don't believe repetition works, then why do you buy Coca-Cola? Uh, every marketer knows you've hit the story over and over and over and over and over again, and that makes you believe the story. Of course, you're supposed to go through the temple every single month. I got a brother, he goes through every single week 
that repetition is going to sell you on the product. You're going to be sold on it. Just like the Muslim that's doing his repairs every single day, he's going to be so sold on his product, he's willing to fly a plane into a building. That's every type of thought process like that gets into your brain. And it's, it's impossible to just root out immediately. It doesn't change overnight. So I, yeah, I, I was still scared. So when I finally, son. so my son, my son ends up going on his mission like, you know, three weeks later. And uh, he ends up called, uh, ends up in California Spanish speaking. It's cool because I speak Spanish, you know, we both speak Spanish now. But my wife, by this point in time, after that experience, my wife and I have a long talk. And she finally, I guess not finally, but she's starting to see, see things the way I see things. And and she she she's she's losing the faith as well because she's seen seen it in different ways than I did and and, and I appreciate that because she looks at it differently than I do but she sees the light in the same way and we give our son you know the best send off we possibly can we want him to go on his mission and have a you know we want him to try to have a good experience and he goes into the MTC and the letters going back and forth every week, they're, they're very eye-opening. Um, I'm a little paranoid about who's reading our mail, uh, and it's kind of weird because later on I find out the mission president knows things about that are in our emails that I would have thought, you know, just didn't make sense that he knew him with if he hadn't been looking it up. But I, I, I so our son's in a mission, he's in, a, he's in the MTC, and he's he's start he's becoming known as the elder that knows everything because he has an extensive background of church history and is a very good apologist because I taught him well. <laughs> I, I taught him all the I taught him here's the pros here's the cons you know if you so want to believe this is what you need problem. to believe if you if you don't want to believe well this is the stuff that's against it you make up your own mind son of course and and I'll always support that you'll you'll never be rejected if you even if you choose to be a full-on believer I just I can tell you I won't ever go through the temple again because I think I did wrong in in taking you through and, and I think uh, I think I made a mistake and I'll I'll not make that mistake again so so we had a very open relationship in our emails back and forth and 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 my son was always on his mission he was worried he was definitely worried about going uh, he was well. He was really well read, and in the MTC, he could always ask the hardest questions and stump everybody. You know, he he was the great trial investigator. Yes. Um, and he was really struggling with the MTC. And I remember my own mission. For me, the MTC was the hardest part of my mission. It was the world's largest voluntary prison, and I'm not big on prisons. I believe in human freedom and your ability to do whatever you want to do. But I'd committed to it. I. I, barreled, I buckled down, did my two months in the MTC, and, and my son did the same. He did his two months in the MTC. But about this time, oh, this is a couple of months before that, a month or so before he went in, I had discovered uh, the, the, that online site called RFM, Recovery from Mormonism. Steve Benson's uh, site. Uh, is it Steve did that? I, I don't know. He seems to be one of the mods. He, he, he's he's one of the mods and one of, one of the main posters, but I didn't know. Maybe it is his original. But anyway, I, I discovered that site, and I found a lot, lot of like-minded people that had gone through similar things. I had not yet posted on the site, but I would read it often because I could read the stories of what happened to other people there, and I could you know, look at how they had been treated or dealt with. And Oh, man, for some people... Mormonism has been a rough road. It's really been, you know, basically good for me other than the whole discovery of a fraud thing. But, you know, generally speaking, my lifestyle, my, you know, you know, teaching pretty good values and family's important. I've had a pretty good run at it. Some some of those poor people that have been abused by leaders and and some of the terrible stories that you hear, they're really sad and I can understand a lot of pain from reading that. But I uh so I'm kind of frequenting RFM. My son's on his mission, and I keep telling him, you know what, just stick it out till you get out into the field. Because for me, once I got into the field, that whole 
you know, prison, you're going to do everything exactly like us, ro we want you robots to do, that all went away once I got to my mission field. The mission president was a lot more open and we could, you know, we could think for ourselves and, you know, <laughs> it wasn't like you're going to do exactly everything and wear exactly this tie and you can't wear that color of tie because that color is wrong and, you know, we didn't have a mission like that, but as soon as my son got in the field, that's exactly what he had. Really? The, the, the field for him was more restrictive than the MTC was. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, you know, he's a real free spirit. It's got a lot in common with me there, and that that was even harder for him. And he got with his first first and only companion, actually. He got with his first companion, and he was out for about four months. Um, one night, my wife and I got a call, and we found out our son had just been hit by a car. Uh, it was a head-on. He got hit head-on by a drunk driver, and uh, he had been in the hospital. And the freaking president bothered to tell us about this two days after it happened. You're kidding. Yeah, my wife was livid. She's like, what? Two freaking days? And even then, the morgue training kicked in. You respected the mission president. You didn't get mad at him. You said, well, well, thank you for calling. We really appreciate you keeping us up to speed. Then you hang up the phone. It's two freaking days? My son got hit by a car, has a concussion in the hospital, and you don't call me for two days. Why? You promised me, that, and literally he had. We had a phone call with him before my son went on a mission, and he promised us he would take care of our son. But he didn't. He got hit by a car. He didn't even go see our son in the hospital. What? Yep. What is he doing if he's not doing that? I have no freaking clue. Whatever it was, it was more important than taking care of our son as if he were our own child. That 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 irritated me a lot. So, so my testimony has been in shatters now. You know, I had tried to rebuild it a couple of times. It's completely lost. My son's on a mission. The guy that's supposed to be watching out for his welfare, you know, he gets hit by a car. He doesn't tell us parents until two days later because he really didn't know if he was, you know, severely injured or not. And I'm like, I'm like, what in the hell? And and at the same time, I know my son who's writing to me. He is having the, the doubts are getting harder for him because and, and he had this he had an issue on his mission that's different than mine. When I went on my mission, I, I believed. I a hundred percent believed what I was telling was the truth. And so all the hard things, you know, the difficult times, the being away from home, the homesickness and the all that, you could push through that because you believed you were doing it for the right reason. But my son, he wasn't a hundred percent believer. He actually knew a lot of the doctrine, and and he knew a lot of the background. He knew that Joseph Smith had a seer stone and a hat, but if he mentioned that, he would be reprimanded. You can't mm -hmm. tell the investigators that. You can't tell the investigators this. The only thing you teach them is be baptized. You're supposed to find investigators that have gone through rough psychological experiences. They, they, I mean, they were telling them if your kid is, if they just lost a child, that was a golden contact. Go talk to those guys. They, you know, they're targeting people, specifically targeting people that are in a bad way. And my son was smart enough to say, wait a minute, this isn't right. And he kept trying to figure out a way to walk the line between one side and the other. He kept trying to believe, but wasn't really sure he believed. You know, the mission president is promising if you stay on your mission and you stick it out, you'll marry a beautiful girl, your business will be successful, you'll be, oh, the, really? you'll be the great maker in the universe. This is the only way you can be the god and goddesses of the universe is to do this. And, you know, my son loves to make stuff. He's a maker for sure. He loves to build things. been building things since he was two and rebuilt his entire bed from the from the... His bedroom, he took his bedroom apart when he, he took his bed apart when he was two and moved it in the living room so he could watch TV in bed. He's that <laughs> just that kind of kid. And so the mission president is doing this mind job on him, promising him extravagant riches and wealth if he just sticks it out. This and is so he's trying to stick it out. And but at the same time he can't, you know, if if you know, he's he's gotta answer things in ways that he knows isn't really hundred percent truthful. This was you before know? the accident or after? This is after the accident. And so my son, 
you know, two months after the accident is sliding deeper and deeper and deeper in depression. Mm -hmm. And our Christmas call's coming up. You know, when you get to talk to him at Christmas. And we get another call from the mission president. And kind of every time this call comes in and we hear it's the mission president, we're thinking, well, maybe this time, maybe, maybe he's coming home. Yeah. And because, you know, we didn't know. I mean, he was, he was depressed. We knew he was depressed. Um, we knew he was suicidal. Really? And, well, yeah, he'd actually written in the letter that, you know, he was, he was contemplating suicide and stuff like that. And the mission president, two days, or was it one day? Actually, it was like, it was Christmas Eve. The mission president calls us on Christmas Eve. And I get the feeling that, at, for my two experiences with him on the phone, I got the feeling that I'm going to call you only as an absolute last resort because if I don't, I'm going to get caught. So I'll call you about your son getting in the car wreck right before, you know, P day, and he sends a letter to you. I'll let you know he was in a car wreck. Mm -hmm. And right before you're going to talk to him on the phone on Christmas, he calls it up and says, I want you to know that your son was, he's been having suicidal thoughts and has been very depressed. And I'm like, what? And I'd kind of already known he'd had the suicidal thoughts, but the fact that the mission president knew, right. and he was telling more than one person. And he told he told him that he had met with 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 him, and he had said, "I, I want to, you know, I want to take that whole bottle of pills and just disappear. I don't want to keep doing this." And the mission president joked about it. The mission president said, "You know, I, it was just a bottle of aspirin. It would have just gave him a stomach ache. He wouldn't have really been hurt." I'm like, "You freaking! Oh, sorry, mouth uh -huh. closed. This was in my head. In my head, I'm thinking, you freaking idiot." He's suicidal, and you're joking about it. I'm just inside my head. I'm going. Rrr. I want to scream at the guy. You know. I I am so glad I never went through this. I would have flown out and taken my son home. Well, one thing I didn't want to do, and and actually we thought about that. So so the story goes. This is this is the beginnings of what you see today. So uh, my son is. Is suicidal. We talk to him on Christmas, and, and I tell him, you know, no matter what, son, don't risk your life. We had, we had, we shared a lot of letters and a lot of metaphors. He's the kind of person that said, if he if he puts his mind to something, he's going to finish it. And he had made a commitment to do the mission, and here he was going, I've got to finish it because I said I would. Yeah. And I told him sometimes, sometimes you, you if the, if you're pounding your head against a brick wall, son. Don't keep beating your head against the wall. You're just going to give yourself a headache and give yourself a bloody head. Go find a backhoe. Do something different. Sometimes you've got to get out the backhoe and just crash down the wall or go through it a different way. If you're up against a problem, you need to take a different approach. And if that means coming home, we'll welcome you open arms. I'll fly out and get you today if you want me to do that, but it's your decision. I, wanted, I didn't ever want him to feel like we were out rescuing him or grabbing him because he was, you know, for our children, we taught our children to be very self-responsible at early ages. By the time they're 18, if they're not making all their own decisions, you've been a crappy parent. That means they don't just start making all their own decisions at 18. They start at 9, and they start figuring it out all the way up. But, but anyway, we gave him full love and support, but it was always his decision. But after the call at Christmas, I realized that I couldn't just hide in the shadows anymore. I uh, I made <laughs> the first thing I did was I posted on RFM. <laughs> I posted on RFM, and what I posted was the letter from my son, because I didn't know how to respond. It was the letter he said where he is contemplating suicide and was scared and worried, and I said, "Here's my son. He's on a mission. He went on his mission, and his toothpaste was out of the tube." And you just can't put it back in. I said, what do I do? You know, I'm lost. I'm not sure how to help him. I don't want to just step in and rescue him. I don't want him to feel like dad just runs to his rescue. I was, I was torn up. My wife was torn up. And that was the first time I ever posted on RFM. And it blew me away. Just the type of responses you got? Yeah. Within, within an hour, 
there were 35 responses, and it continued on another thread, and another thread, and another thread, and the responses were amazing. They were loving and compassionate. Some people were pissed at the church, and I get that. But for the most part, every I had I had no less than three people offer to buy the airline ticket home for him. I had people ready to jump in a car and go rescue him. And these were complete strangers, people I'd never met in person. And all I did was post an anonymous thing on a web page, and I had this huge response. And I took that entire response, I copied like all 17 pages of it, yeah. and I emailed it to my son. And I said, wow. maybe in here is something you can learn that's different. And he read that, and he told me later, he said, you know what? Of all the things the mission president said, of all the things my companion said, of all the things everybody told me, what those guys were saying made the most sense. And it helped me the most. And I, that's when I finally realized that I was hiding enough. Enough with the hiding, enough with the pretending you're somebody or not. And I decided I might, I might, and I think the I think the analogy is coming out. It's like the gay guy coming out and said, "Hey, I'm gay, everybody. By the way, not really, you know, de la mano levantada. I'm, I'm I'm not that kind of guy." But it was the same kind of experience. And I decided, my wife and I decided, we've got to tell our parents. So we invited our parents, my parents first for dinner, and we told them I didn't believe in the church anymore. Told them why, freaked them out. Um, <laughs> It was before we go before we go into this, I think we're kind of at a, a transition point here. Uh -huh. are, are you at a point where you can kind of resolve what happened with your son on his mission? Uh, um, kind of. Well, I can I can tell you. Uh, if you jump ahead, well, give me. Let me tell you this because I think it'll make sense. Because what happened to him is right after that. That makes sense. Okay, I just I have to come to a. We'll we'll divide this into two parts. Where the first part is kind of your. By all biography, and then we'll get oh, okay. more into the fridge in the second part. But I have to, we'll have to do that another day because. Oh sure, um, no problem. It, I, I, we said what thirty minutes, and it's been what an hour and a half already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I hope people like watching us because I think I got a really cool looking puppet, man. Uh, you do, and I'm I'm really enjoying learning this, uh, you know, about your background. It's very touching, actually. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, so we came clean with our parents, and that's the short story, because. I thought there was a reasonably good chance my son was coming home, and I wasn't willing to let him come home and be the failure alone. I see. I didn't want him going through that, and I didn't know for sure if he would. It, it, it turned out about a month later he decided to return home, okay. and I'm glad it was his own decision. And, and he was messed up for a lot of months, um, but... but uh, but he did come home, and we loved him, and eventually, I think eventually he started to see things, and, and they became clearer, and it, it, there really is a real psychological game. It, it blows me away. I never thought I was in a situation where I was literally brainwashed, but I was. My son was, and I could tell now because I was scared. I was scared, spitless, to tell my parents I didn't believe the church was true. Think about that. Uh, I think that um, in our next conversation, that's going to be a good place for us to start about the psychology of why you felt that way, and then how that gave genesis to the Church of the Fridge and and the um, revelations that came therein. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so I want to I want to thank you and our viewers for um, taking the time to um, you know give us a little bit of insight into your life. You've you know opened up in a way here that um, you know it, it it can be very tender and um, difficult to do and I appreciate you taking the time to do that. So uh hey, we'll, We'll record part two uh, later this week or this month and, um, and get to learn more. So I want to thank you for being our guest and uh, say hi to everyone next time. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, Omo, Nomo, however you All say right. it. <laughs> I like <laughs> the care. thinker of thoughts, dude. That, that. <laughs> okay, so, take care. Take care. Bye.